record. All right, we're up and running, people. Okay, so let us, okay, we'll talk about the different components to the spongy bone. Now, first things first, spongy bone, all right, is going to have some similarities between compact bone and, and then it's going to have some differences, all right? One of the differences is it's not going to have an osteon. Okay? There are no osteons present all right, when we're dealing with spongy bone. All right? But it will, have, can, it will have lamellae, but we give it a different name. All right? These are called parallel lamellae. Okay? And the same type of situation with this lamellae as we saw in compact bone is that we'll have lacuna in these lamellae, and we'll have osteocytes that live in those uh, lacuna. Okay? In the same type of situation also, those lacuna need to communicate to one another, so those osteocytes can share nutrients, communicate with one another. So we'll see cannuliculi going from one lacuna to the next. All right? So that'll be a similarity there. All right? So we call spongy bone, spongy bone, or trabecular bone because of this structure here, the trabeculae. All right? It's like this network, all right, or I always think of it like scaffolding. All right? Your textbook likes to refer to it as a lattice type of configuration. All right, but it's like all these rods that just go from different parts of the bone. All right, and so they make this crisscrossing kind of appearance in the bone. And the nice thing about this, again, I'm not an architect, I'm not an engineer, but because of these crisscrossing formations that occurs, it actually increases all right, the bone's ability to resist multi-directional different stresses. Okay, so it's kind of cool. You know, you would think that, all right, that's more of the compact bone's job, and it is. All right. But this is the trabecular bone, the spongy bone, trying to put in its, you know, it's contributing. It's like the little kid that's helping to move, you know, a big piece of furniture when it's really, you know, the adults moving it and the kids just kind of helping out a little bit. Well, that's what the trabecular is doing here. Okay. So when we jump into here, all right, we zoom in on our trabeculae. Okay, you can see here's our our lattice work, our lattice work here. All right, and then we just do a nice cross section. And you can see here in our trabeculae, we don't have a central canal, all right? So there's no osteon formation here, all right? It looks very similar because we got our parallel lamellae running around here, and we also have our uh, lacuna with the osteocytes in it, and we still see the, the cannuliculi here, but we're just missing that central canal here, all right? And those osteon formations. All right, we'll still include the other cells, osteocytes, all right, we'll have our osteoclast because we're always going to be remodeling bone, all right, through bone resorption there, which we talked about last class. All right, so just kind of keep in mind some of these differences between the trabecular bone, the spongy bone, and the compact bone, all right? A, a, a test question I've seen before asks about osteons. And so know for a fact that there's no osteon in spongy bone, okay? That's a great true-false question. All right, we can throw that out at you. Okay, so now... Talking about the different aspects of bone, okay, now we're going to learn how we make the bone. We kind of addressed it quickly, how bone is made up of organic and inorganic components. And it's the osteoblasts that secrete the osteoid, right? They make it, they secrete it, and that's like the wet cement, all right? And that's primarily made up of a, of a ground substance, but pro, uh, collagen fibers, right? And we've got some proteoglycans and some glycoproteins that we sprinkle in there to make it kind of gooey. Well, in order to harden it, in order to cause that process of calcification, right, we have to sprinkle in our calcium phosphate that, to make that hydroxyapatite, those crystals there. And then that will essentially harden the bone matrix to give us our bone. Okay? But now we're going to talk about how the bone is kind of modeled. Right? How, why does a rib look like a rib? Why do the long bones in your fingers look like long bones? Well, we started off with a cartilage uh, um, model. And then we transform that cartilage model into, all right, a current bony model. So we're going to talk about that. So we're going to talk. We're going to switch gears, talk about cartilage here for a few moments, and primarily the most popular cartilage in our body, which is the hyaline cartilage. All right. For this chapter, we're going to talk about the two cartilages, not really so much fibrocartilage that much, okay? But we're going to mainly talk a lot about our hyaline cartilage right here, okay? So cartilage, again, is very similar. If you, if you haven't picked up this concept, all right, when we're dealing with bone and we're dealing with cartilage, both of those tissues are connective tissue, specifically supporting connective tissue. And because it's a connective tissue, then it has three ingredients. 
cells, okay? It's also going to have the extracellular matrix, which is subdivided down into the ground substance. That's our proteoglycans and our glycoproteins, all right? And then the protein fibers, which will primarily will be collagen, all right, when we're, when we're talking about uh, our, our different types of connective tissue. So when we talk about hyaline cartilage, okay, same type of rule applies. We're going to have cells. In this case, we're talking about cartilage. They're going to be chondrocytes. Those are the mature cartilage cell. But we also have chondroblasts. That's going to be the cell that makes the cartilage, okay? It makes the cartilage matrix. We don't have chondroclasts, okay? So there's, you don't even have to worry about that, okay? So it's our cells that are going to be found scattered all throughout, all right, the cartilage matrix inside of these protein fibers, all right? Protein fibers will pre predominantly be collagen, okay? So if it's collagen, it's going to have, it's going to be strong. It's going to be sturdy, all right? So these cells secrete their cartilage matrix, similar to osteoid, all right? It's going to be gel-like, all right? But in this case, the osteoid that's made primarily has, all right, the proteoglycans, but not calcium. I want you to think, if we add calcium to anything right now, just right now, all right? If we add calcium to anything, it's going to make it hard, like brick, all right? That's what it does to our bones. It makes our bricks, our bricks, makes our bones stiff and rigid, okay? But cartilage isn't stiff and rigid. I mean, it's tough, it's more flexible. So we don't want to include cartilage into our, into our uh, excuse me, we don't want to include calcium into our cartilage. So our, our matrix there is not going to include calcium because calcium is going to ruin the party. It's going to turn everything stiff and rigid and hard. And that's bone. Cartilage doesn't play like that, okay? So because of that, we don't have the calcium. We've got a nice flexible, all right, connective tissue. All right, that's still going to have some resiliency to multidirectional forces, which is cool. That's what we want. All right, what adds a lot to its flexibility is this next fact here. All right, that cartilage has a high percentage of water. All right, higher. When I say that, in comparison to bone, it has a really a large amount of a, 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 a high percentage of water compared to bone, but it's not like. Uh, like wringing out a sponge type of water, okay? So the water, again, will help to add to that flexibility there, okay? But as you know, cartilage is wonderful because we put it at the end of our long bones. We call it articular cartilage. It helps to make the ends of the long bones much more uh, smooth and slippery, so there's less friction, but it also acts as a shock absorber, which is awesome. Fiber cartilage, the same thing, okay? So that's what we want to see. But an important fact that you need to know is this last bullet point here at the bottom. Mature cartilage is avascular. Mature cartilage is. Right? Immature cartilage is not. So that's a, a significant. So if you get a test question and it talks about mature cartilage, you should be thinking avascular and it has no nerves, no sensory nerves. So cartilage technically does not detect pain. Okay? No nervous innervation there. Okay, there's a lot on that slide, but I wanted to go through that. All right, so last week we talked about the different types of cells in bone. Let's talk about some of the cells and some of the characteristics of cartilage, okay? So same type of scenario as we saw with the bone. Osteoblast B, build bone. Chondroblast B are going to make the cartilage matrix there. Similar type of situation, all right, the chondroblast keeps secreting that matrix, and then they surround themselves in the matrix. They get cut off, all right? And then what they do is they convert into a chondrocyte, all right? And then they're going to live in the matrix and maintain the matrix, okay? So, and its home is the same name as, a, as an osteocyte had. We call that a lacuna. It's a small space or chamber there, okay? And its job is just going to be to upkeep, maintain that cartilage matrix, okay? So there's some damage, and we needed to actually... Uh, repair the matrix, no problem. The chondrocyte converts back into a chondroblast, secretes the matrix to repair or do whatever or grow, and then it goes back into its chondrocyte form. All right, so on the bone, we saw we had periosteum, which was that outer uh, uh, fibrous uh, covering to the, the cartilage. All right, same thing here uh, to the bone. And same thing here when we're talking about cartilage. All right, we have our perichondrium, okay? And it's similar to periosteum in that they're both made up, the outer fibrous layer there, 
all right, of the periosteum is made of dense, irregular connective tissue. Well, guess what? So is the perichondrium. That allows things to attach to it. That also, that dense, irregular connective tissue also allows for to, uh, the cartilage to have its intended shape, okay? So keep that in mind, all right? Helps to maintain its shape. It also helps, all right, to protect it, all right? But it, la it allows certain structures to attach onto it, much like with periosteum, all right? The outer fibrous layer, that's where the ligaments attach onto. That's where your tendons attach onto. So it being made up of dense or regular connective tissue helps it from tearing or getting damaged. Okay. So now we're going to get into story time. I'm probably going to spend the rest of the night, well, not the night, all right, but lecture class telling you different stories of how cartilage grows. And it's really kind of like in a story fashion, all right, because keep in mind, your skeleton, your fetal skeleton, we call it, all right, when you take a humanoid shape on, you produce this hyaline cartilage skeleton when you're a fetus, and then it transitions into bone. That starts usually between weeks 8 to 12. So prior to that, when you're starting to take a humanoid shape and your body is starting to produce that cartilage, all right, we're going to now talk about all right, how that cartilage is going to grow. And there's two ways that it can grow. It can grow up like we do, you grow taller, all right, but it also grows out like a tree does. Okay? If you have a tree in your front yard 20 years ago and you look at it today, it's much bigger, it's much thicker. All right? So we're going to learn about growing up, a tree grows up, and a tree grows out. And that's what our cartilage is going to do. Okay? So to do that, all right, there's two types of growth that you need to be familiar with. All right? This is going to occur when you're an embryo, growing inside a mommy before week eight. Okay? So the two types of growth are interstitial growth and appositional growth. Okay? So interstitial growth is the tree growing up. It gets taller, all right? So it's going to grow in length, all right? This occurs because of what happens inside the cartilage. So an easy way to remember that is interstitial, I-N-T, all right, for interstitial is I-N-T internal, okay? This is happening deep in the bowels of the cartilage, all right, as it's starting to grow and those cells are dividing and they're making more matrix, and then those cells divide, and then they make more matrix, all right? So that's how, all right, our little cartilage trees grow, how it grows taller, okay? How it gets thicker, because if you look, the bones in our bodies, all right, are much thicker than when you were two, okay? So same type of scenario here. Like a tree grows uh, thicker, all right, so does our cartilage. We refer to that as appositional growth, all right? This cartilage will grow in width, and this happens on the outside edge, all right, of the cartilage. The perichondrium is responsible for that. I remember the periosteum, there was two layers. You had your outer fibrous layer, and that was made of the dense connective tissue, and then you had the inner cell layer, all right, that had the osteoprogenerator cells, the osteocytes, and the osteoblasts. Well, all right, when we're dealing with perichondrium, it's going to have those chondroblasts, and they're going to be doing the same thing. They're going to be just underneath that outer layer, and they're going to be dividing and growing cartilage matrix. And as that happens, because that's how trees grow, you know, they just keep adding a ring because they're growing from the edge. Does any, did anyone here ever take cell, uh, not cell, but plant biology? Uh, <laughs> anyways, I'm telling you, I don't know how I re retain some of this information. It's just, um, and I couldn't tell you the name of it, but you know on the outside of a tree, I don't know why that did that. All right, um, on the outside of the tree, you have the bark, okay? That's the rough edges, all right? But just below the bark, if you peel that bark off, and I can't remember the name of that layer, all right, it's a very thin, thin layer, but it's, it's a, a very active layer, all right, of the tree. And that's the part that keeps producing whatever the tree, the wood, okay? And it just keeps going bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and wider water every year. So technically, it's supposed to be that if you chop a tree down, you count the rings, you can tell how long it's been alive for. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm not a botanist. The phylum? The phylum. Phylum, yeah, yeah. So um, it's also hypothesized that the same thing could be said about the lenses in our eyes, that every year our lens makes a layer so uh, there was a study done, I don't even know what became of it, 
but um, that they were going to dissect the lens in the eye and then they could uh, tell how many layers of whatever they were studying. I can't even remember what tissue it was in the lens, but it was supposed to be how many years uh, that you were alive. And that's how they said they could really tell your true age. Um, again, I didn't follow up on that. Okay, any questions so far? We good with appositional and interstitial? All right, appositional, width, getting wider, okay? Interstitial, length, okay? One's inside, one's outside. Interstitial's inside, that's internal. All right, appositional's outside. Okay, so let's talk about the first type of growth, and that's gonna be the interstitial growth. So we're gonna study now. I'm gonna do this. I, I'm going to, well, no, I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> don't worry about what I was just thinking. All right, you guys got that? Next slide. Just kidding. All right, I'm going to zoom in here. All right. All right. So first, a couple things. This first picture here that you're seeing. All right. There's two boxes. We're going to be studying the the, this, the box that's more internal. This box is to the internal portion of the cartilage. So this is going to be the interstitial growth. All right. Appositional growth. Gro that occur growth occurs right here. That's right below the perichondrium here. Okay. So we're first going to study our interstitial growth. So we're going to go in stages here. All right, so the first stage is we start off with the chondrocyte, okay? And it's just sitting there, hanging out in its lacuna. It decides to divide, okay? Undergo mitosis. So now, where there was once one cell, bam, now we got two cells, okay? So we have two cells, and they're occupying the same lacuna, all right? That's like two grown adults trying to occupy a hammock, all right? Doesn't work well, right? And if you're in the in the hammock with somebody else, you better be dating them, all right? I'm just saying, it's just difficult. There's not a lot of room there. And so these cells want their space, all right? They want to have their space. So at this point, we refer to both of these cells as chondroblasts. So what do chondroblasts do? They make cartilage matrix. That's what they do. So that's what these cells are going to do. They're going to start to produce that cartilage matrix all around, all around their bodies. And see, you can start to see as it's producing that new matrix all around its cell, all right, it starts to move the cells apart from one another, okay? So now when they start to separate from one another, okay, they're going to still keep doing the same thing. At this point, when they're two individual cells, we go back to referring to them as a chondrocyte, but guess what? Those chondrocytes keep producing that matrix until now they're fully separated from one another, and they each have their own lacuna, okay? And then they can divide again, and the same process happens, okay? So this is, it's a very basic type of process. Once there is one cell, it divides, and there's two cells occupying the same lacuna. They're producing cell matrix, all right? Once they've fully separated from each other, all right, we consider them chondrocytes again. They continue, they continue to uh, produce the cell matrix until they both now occupy their own lacuna. And at that point, they can just maintain the matrix, they can divide, whatever, okay? So this happens. It's not just in this picture here we see, all right, we got two cells here. But imagine all of these cells doing this, all right? This is not happening like one or two cells. You get hundreds if not thousands of cells doing this, you know, constantly, all right? And so that's how we start to make the interstitial growth, that length-like growth of cartilage. So... Now, let's look at appositional growth. This is right underneath our perichondrium here, okay? Very similar type of story, okay? It's just location, okay? So now, <clears throat> we're looking right underneath the perichondrium here. So that's what this picture is showing us, all right? So you've got your perichondrium. Remember, a significant, especially an immature cartilage, a significant amount of our perichondrium is going to be, I can't, I got to interrupt myself. I can't tell you to remember because I haven't taught you this yet. Um, but the perichondrium, I keep getting the sections confused. The perichondrium, all right, is made up at this point in immature cartilage of mesenchyme. Remember mesenchyme tissue, right? That's the embryonic stem cell, all right, that is going to give us all right, either more stem cells or committed cells. So in this case, we have these mesenchyme cells here. So when they divide, they're going to give us two new cells, 
right? One is going to stay a mesenchyme cell, and the other one's going to turn into what we call a committed cell, all right? And that committed cell is going to be, all right, one of our cartilage cells, our, car our chondroblasts, all right? So now you can see we've got these two chondroblasts here, all right? And they're stuck in this layer, and all of these cells are starting to make this new matrix. They, they form, they get pushed into this layer here, and what do they do? First thing they do, they just start making new matrix. And then what happens is they're making the new matrix, it pushes them deeper into the cartilage, okay? So you can see here, right, you have these undifferentiated stem cells, they'll differentiate into, they'll commit into a, a, a chondroblast, Right? So they turn into a chondroblast, and a chondroblast, what's it do? It builds matrix. So it starts to produce all this matrix here. And as it's making that, all right, the older cells get pushed down as the newer cells get pushed down into that area there. See how we're talking about? All right? So as that happens, that's going to push the perichondrium further and further away from the center of our cartilage. Therefore, like a tree, it grows outwards. Okay? And that's what we're going to pretty much see in the same type of scenario here. All right, once there was two living in this lacuna, they'll keep producing that new matrix until they've completely separated themselves. Okay? And then this layer of matrix will get pushed further down, all right, because new cells are moving in. Okay? And that pushes everything further to the periphery. Okay? So that is appositional growth. So we're going to study this same type of concept when we get into bone, okay? But I want you to understand first how cartilage is made, how we make the cartilage matrix, excuse me, the, car, the highland cartilage model to our skeleton. Because once that model is made, now we have to take this rubbery cartilage baby humerus and turn it into a bony adult humerus. And we're going to talk about how we do that, okay? But to understand that first, we got to show you how it's done with the cartilage. All right, questions? <clears throat> no? All right. All right, so let's talk about the process of ossification, how we make new bone. All right, and this process occurs between, it's, well, it starts between eight. eight weeks 8 through 12, and it goes all the way through at this point. <laughs> no, I know, it's overwhelming, but trust me, let's see, once you go through this several times, it'll become a little bit better, okay? You folks have the advantage of these um, slideshows here, or these videos that you can watch over again. I would sit down and, and watch for like 20 minutes. You don't even have to watch the whole video. Watch it, kind of absorb it, chew on a little bit, Watch the presidential debate, you know, it's really up to you. I'm just kidding. Not that I'm all about the presidential debate, but that's all they've been talking about on the news. Okay, so this process is going to occur all the way up to adolescence, okay? Adolescence is early 20s, all right? But it's going to start as early as the eighth week of development. You want to know these dates, 8 through 12, all right? That's when we start this process here, okay? This is how this process is going to give us bone, okay? You dissect the term osteobone, genesis is new, all right? The creation of new bone, okay? So there's two types, all right, of growth that we're going to discuss. The first one is called intra-within membranous, intramembranous ossification, and then endochondral ossification. Those are our two types, so you need to know all right, intramembranous ossification, then endochondral ossification. All right, let's start with the first one. This one here we won't spend nearly as much time talking about, okay? All right, so this type of ossification we're going to see, all right, in a, well, not so much the long bones, but we're going to see it mainly in our flat bones, all right? Some of the irregular shaped bones like your facial bones. All right, one of my favorite, and I, don't ask me why, I've had people ask me this before, but one of my favorite facts about intramembranous ossification is that the center of the clavicle undergoes intramembranous ossification, but the ends of the clavicle undergo endochondral ossification. So you get two different types of bone formation occurring in the same bone. 
This is kind of neat. It's the only bone that does that. Okay. So we'll see this occurring also in our jaw. All right. So there's going to be several steps to this intramembranous ossification. Right? And I'm going to walk you through. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go over one step, take you to a picture, kind of show you through the picture, and then we'll come back. Okay. So we'll go nice and easy. And there's only four steps for intramembranous ossification. All right. And if you, but, it, but if you feel somewhat comfortable with it, then it makes the other type of ossification a little bit easier to understand. I don't expect everybody to have a really commanding understanding or grasp of this material right now. This is a lot. If you do, then I'm an awesome teacher. <laughs> All right, but still, okay, just try to grab on the small parts of this. This is a lot of information here. Okay, so the first type of oss the, the first step, I should say, to the intramembranous ossification. All right, so what we're dealing with are these pockets of mesenchyme tissue. They're just sitting there, okay? So you have these pockets of this mesenchyme tissue, that embryonic stem cell, all right, tissue, that's going to change into a committed cell, all right? So what happens is some of those mesenchyme cells give us these cells, the osteoprogenerator cells. And if you recall from last class, the osteoprogenerator cells give us osteoblasts, all right? And osteoblasts do one thing. They build bone, and they always start off by building bone with osteoid, okay? That's the organic, you need to know that. It's the organic bone matrix, okay? So the osteoid is the ground substance, and it's going to be the protein fibers, which is collagen, okay? It's the wet cement, all right? In this case, we need something to make it, to harden it, and that comes later on. So I'm going to come back to this slide. Let me show you a picture. All right, so here's what we're seeing. All right, so in our, we're using the example of the infant skull here, all right, in the baby's frontal bone here, you have all this mesenchyme tissue just sitting around, okay? And what will happen now is some of these mesenchyme cells are going to differentiate into osteoprogenerator cells. And those osteoprogenerator cells will now turn into osteoblasts. And these osteoblasts start to make osteoid, okay? That's all that's happening here in step one. Nothing terribly exciting, okay? We're just seeing a bunch of mesenchyme turn into osteoprogenerator cells, and then we're seeing osteoprogenerator cells, all right, turn into osteoblasts. And then they start just making the osteoid, laying down collagen fibers, laying down ground substance, okay? So they're getting ready for something. Who knows? It's like a party. Okay, so the second step here, okay, is... Well, just like with anything, if we're going to be making, the, making osteoid, then we need to get the osteoid to harden. So what do we do? All right, we invite calcium. Because remember what I told you, calcium makes things hard and rigid. Okay? So these calcium salts along, and they get sprinkled along the collagen fibers in our osteoid. And that process there causes that crystallization, the hardening of the osteoid. Problem is, when that happens, now unfortunately, those osteoblasts have sealed themselves up. So they're stuck. So now they're trapped in the matrix there, but that's when we see them transition into osteocytes. Okay? So they've literally sealed themselves into the floor. You guys probably heard me talking about this last week with the cask of Amontillado, that kind of thing. All right? So that's what we're going to see here in this second slide here. <clears throat> all right, here's what we got. We got our matrix here, all right? Some calcium salts come in, and they start to in infiltrate into the, the, to the matrix, into the osteoid, and it causes that calcification and hardening, all right, of the bone tissue. And unfortunately, some of those cells get stuck, and they convert into osteocytes. And what their job will be is going to be to maintain, all right, this bone tissue here. Okay, so that's the second part. Okay, so the first part, we laid down the osteoid, got the goo set up. Now we got to make that goo hard, no problem. Second step, calcium comes in and it turns the osteoid into the actual hard bone matrix there. Okay, and we unfortunately, we've trapped some of our colleagues here. All right, some of them are going to die, but that's not a bad thing. So when some of them die, they make a hole in the bone. And that's what we start to see here. You can see how there's holes starting to develop in the bone. All right, and when we get holes in the bone, then we get blood vessels. Well, that's cool. 
You want blood vessels coming in because they're going to bring nutrients in. They're going to bring more calcium in, more phosphate, all sorts of good stuff. So now we can kick this thing up, all right, into overdrive. All right, moving on to step three. So as we start to make this bone, we got to give it a name, all right? So this premature, not I don't want to say premature, but this brand new bone, this primary bone, all right, is called woven bone. We'll see this again in a fracture, all right? That's what your body does initially when it's the first form of bone that it grows when your a bone is fractured and, and it's repairing itself is woven bone. It's kind of it's garbage bone, <laughs> all right? But it's just a way to try to to to, to unite the bone back again, all right? It won't stay there very long. So we start to make this woven bone, all right? It's poorly organized, all right? Yes, it's immature because it's the, it's the first form of the bone, but your body's gonna quickly remodel over this. It doesn't wanna keep it, but it's, it's, it just, it's filling a space right now, okay? So we get our woven bone forming. At the same time, all right, that mesenchyme that's on the periphery of this bone starts to turn into periosteum, okay? Which is good. Because now, with the periosteum, we can grow more bone. All right? So that happens in step three. We're getting our woven bone, the early form of our immature, all right, primary bone, and we're getting periosteum out of it. Okay? So as we move here to our third step, you can see now our bone is growing at a much more rapid rate. Okay? So all this is this woven bone. All right, we're starting to get the blood vessels in there so we can make more quickly. And then on the side here, okay, on the periphery, we can see that this mesenchyme is now turning into periosteum. So the outer layer is going to turn into that dense, irregular, all right, connective tissue. And then this inner layer, that's going to yield us our cell layer, all right? And that's where we're going to have our osteoclasts, our osteoblasts, our osteoprogenerator cells, okay? So we'll see them hanging out on the inside. Well, in the meantime, we still have all these other cells in, in the inside here, building away, building bone. All right, the last step, right? This is when we start to transition our bone from that um, immature, poorly organized primary bone to the bone that we ideally want, what we call our secondary bone or the lamellar bone, okay? This is that uh, mature bone that we see that yields us both compact and spongy bone. Okay, and so in this case, this goes back to what I was describing to you before when I was talking about the sandwich, all right? Two loaves of bread, not two loaves of bread, two slices of bread, right? that's gonna be the compact bone, and the trabecular bone is gonna be whatever you put in the middle of your sandwich, the bologna or the peanut butter, all right? So that's what we're gonna see. The two external layers are gonna be the compact bone with our lamella bone, and then in the center, all right, is gonna be our spongy bone. And that's what we're going to see. This is intramembranous ossification. And we're not going to see this type of ossification when we're talking about the humerus or the femur, the long bones there, or the phalanges. Okay? That's this guy right here. That's our fourth one. Okay? So here we can see, all right, now, all right, we've got our lamellar bone. We've got our compact bone on the periphery. All right? And then we, in the center here, we've got our spongy bone. And this is that mature secondary bone. At the same time, we've got our, our periosteum on the periphery. And we've got our nice inner cell layer from the periosteum. So now we're growing more bone there. And at the same time, we're growing more bone here on the inside. Okay? But notice, there's no medullary cavity here, right? No. Okay? We're not dealing with the long bone. Okay? All right, questions so far? Intraosseous ossification is a little bit easier than the endochondral. There's many more steps in endochondral. You feel pretty confident somewhat? See a pattern here, All right? Our cells, they start to produce the, the matrix there. They get sealed up, all right? And then they uh, transition into a, a maintenance cell, you know, but at the same time, calcium comes in and it starts to harden everything, okay? So that's pretty much... The, the type of idea I want you guys to keep in mind right now as we go through this chapter, make it a little bit easier to, to, to learn. <clears throat> All right, let me take a quick sip here. All right, so when we're talking about endrochondrosification, I think there's seven or eight steps. Six. Oh, okay, there's only six steps. All right, so same type of thing. 
we're going to go step by step, and I'll take you picture by picture, okay? So this is the one, all right, which now we go back to that Highland cartilage that we were grilling, all right, quite busily, if that's even a word, all right? We were trying to make this cartilage model for us to make a skeleton from, okay, prior to week eight. And so we've just finished that skeleton. So now, right, our model for it, just like in movies, uh, they make a model of a set and then they build the set. Well, that's what we're going to do here. We've made our model. And now we're going to transition that model from one type of connective tissue to another type of connective tissue. All right, we're going to transform it all right, from cartilage connective tissue to bone connective tissue. All right, so we're going to see this, all right, in most of the bones that um, in our skeleton, except for the ones that we saw on the previous page, okay? So long bones primarily, so a lot of the bones in the upper and lower limbs, right? Some of our regular bones, like the vertebrae, pelvis, guess what? There's the ends of the clavicle, right? Because the center of the clavicle is intramembranous. And I've seen that asked as a test question, okay? So really commit that one fact to your brain today, that the center of the clavicle undergoes intramembranous ossification while the ends, all right, of the clavicle undergo endochondral ossification, okay? It's a really good test question. All right, so we're going to be talking about the long bone. For the example that we're going to use here, we're going to use the humerus, okay? So we're all familiar with the humerus because we studied that last week, okay? So let's start off with the first step, easy, okay? That's the, where, the one where we start off with a cartilage model, okay? So this happens anywhere between eight to 10 weeks, all right, we'll have our cartilage model ready. So our chondroblasts are secreting that matrix to have made that model, real simple, all right? Show you the picture, we'll be bored with it, but that's okay. There you go. So weeks eight to 12, okay? We have now produced a little baby model here of a humerus, all right, complete its own perichondrium, okay? So going back to the cartilage model growth, all right? Remember the two types of growth, all right? We had the interstitial, that's the bone getting longer, all right? And then we had the appositional, that was the bone getting thicker, okay? So both of those have occurred here already, okay? So everything that I taught you about 10 minutes ago has occurred right now, okay? That's how we made our little bone. All right, a little baby humerus. Okay. Step two. Okay. Now we have got to get this cartilage to become harder. So that process is referred to as calcification. So our calcium now is going to start to harden. Okay. Calcium has infiltrated this area. All right. And we start to see, all right, this cartilage matrix hardening. Well, guess what? Cartilage, all right, well, mature cartilage is avascular. It doesn't have a blood supply. So those cells that are trapped in that cartilage matrix cannot get nutrients. What happens to those cells? They die. They did. Okay? So as this matrix hardens, we can't diffuse I can't diffuse something through this brick wall, okay? That's essentially what I, I would be trying to do. I'd be trying to diffuse nutrients and waste through a brick wall to somebody on the side. That's the same thing as trying to diffuse nutrients through a calcified cartilage matrix. You just can't do it, okay? So as that matrix calcifies, these poor cells die. Well, guess what? When those cells decompose and disappear, they leave a hole there, all right? Well, that's to our advantage now. Because now we're going to have this bone here, all right, that's going to have all these large holes there, okay? Well, we saw before when we were talking about the intramembranous ossification, all right, blood vessels will start to find their way into those holes, all right? And that's called neovascularization. And so these blood vessels grow, all right, into the cartilage, and they go through those nooks and crannies, okay? Well, that's good. Because now we're, we're actually setting up a supply chain here, okay? So if I had to take a, a ROTC when I was in college, so I got to learn about supply chains. 
So there's, I'm giving you some military knowledge here in case you plan on going to invading Quebec. All right. Oh, wait, the French are our allies. What am I saying? <laughs> Which reminds me, there was a, an article, not an article, a public, a, a political cartoon, and it had uh, uh, all these people at the UN, and this one guy had both his arms thrown up in the air, and uh, the, I don't know, the, the speaker of the uh, um, United Nations says, "Will someone please tell the French diplomat to stop surrendering?" <laughs> anyway, okay, so. And <laughs> back back to our cartilage here. Right, as we're starting to see this this hardening occurring, we're going to get what's called the periosteal bone collar. All right, this periosteal bone collar is this literal all right uh, connective tissue. This bone connective starts to surround the diaphysis. All right, the diaphysis of our long bone, our humerus here. So we'll start to see this occur. And the reason why is because these osteoblasts have come in, come in on the scene now. Okay? We've got blood vessels, so they can come in on the blood vessels. All right? What they do is, all right, they do what they do, which is to build bone. What do they do? They synthesize and secrete the osteoid. Okay? Well, we already know that there's calcium in the area because the cartilage matrix is calcified. All right? So as cells are laying down that osteoid, it's immediately calcified, and it causes that calcification, all right, that hardening of that bone matrix, and we see that initially around the diaphysis of our long bone here. So going down to our picture, now I can't see you guys at home, but I can see you guys here in the classroom. Is everyone pretty good with... The first step. All right, that's the easy one. Second one, a little bit tougher. Okay, so again, here we're seeing, okay, where, all right, here we're seeing, all right, step two here, we have our cartilage cells here that have died because the matrix here started to calcify and became really hard. So as they started to die, holes uh, built up here in the diaphysis, okay? And what happens is blood vessels have now infiltrated this area, all right? And we get osteoblasts now that are coming in. They start laying down osteoid. Well, the calcium that's in here is going to cause that osteoid to calcify, and we start to see the beginnings here along the diaphysis of our long bone, a bone tissue occurring here, okay? And so we call that the periosteal bone collar. That's the first part of this, okay? So you can see over here, and we haven't gotten to this yet, what happens in step three. We're going to see a lot of stuff happening here. But it's going to be a very similar story, all right? Just keep in mind, chondroblasts secrete, all right, cartilage matrix. Then that matrix will harden, okay? And then the, those cells will seal themselves into the matrix, and they convert into a chondrocyte. Same thing with osteoblasts. They make the matrix, the matrix hardens, they get stuck in there, and they turn into osteocytes. It's similar. That's what we're going to see. Okay? What keeps them alive is if there's a blood supply there to keep them alive. All right? So if there's no blood, then those cells will die off, they'll make holes, but then eventually blood vessels will get there. All right? So it's a, I don't want to say it's a trial and error, but you won't always get a blood supply there in time to keep that tissue alive. No problem. When it dies, there'll be holes made, and then we can get we can further our blood vessels throughout the matrix, and eventually we'll get everything. All right. So it's a it's a little bit kind of thing. All right. So that was step two. On to step three. Okay. So now, all right. At this point, we have achieved what we call a primary ossification center, and that's what we saw back in step two. Okay. So we saw that the first area of where the bone matrix started to ossify, all right, or harden, was in the diaphysis, all right, and, and we have that periosteal, all right, uh, ossification center there going on. Well, now we start to see, okay, these structures here, the periosteal bud, okay? And basically what a periosteal bud is, is a blood supply, which are our capillaries, and our osteoblasts. 
So these periosteal buds now are going to be carrying our bone building uh, cells and a supply chain with the capillary blood flow. All right. And so this is going to occur throughout the whole diathesis. Right? The diathesis is where we're going to find our primary ossification center. <clears throat> All right. So most of the primary ossification centers in your bones are uh, have occurred by week 12 of your development. That's pretty good. Okay. And so what happens are is you know these primary ossification centers will work toward well they're going to work from the in well from the center oh it's awful all right they're going to work towards the epiphysis so the primary ossification centers usually will start in the middle portion here of the diaphysis and then they'll work towards each epiphysis <clears throat> converting all of that cartilage matrix into all right, bone tissue. Okay, so this last statement, bone connective tissue displaces calcified degenerating cartilage. Okay, because, all right, once that cartilage matrix is hardened through the calci calcification process, it's essentially killing all those chondrocytes and any chondroblasts there because it's sealed itself off from any type of diffusion process of nutrients. So as that material, as that tissue is dead, all right, the bone connective tissue comes in and takes over. Okay, so it's a remodeling process here. So that's what we're seeing here. Okay, we started in the center here. All right, so we started in the center. Okay, and so as more and more of this calcified matrix is dying off, all right, from the from the from the cartilage, all right, more holes are opening up, more blood vessels are coming in, more osteoblasts are coming in, and they're kind of using um, that old dead calcified cartilage matrix as a scaffolding, and it's remodeling bone right over that. Um, did I tell you about the story about my mom and her knee? This is oh well. I should tell you, this is the reason why I'm the favorite son in my family. It's because my dog didn't break my mother's leg. My brother had a boxer. My mom came down to visit. This is years ago. This is before I was living down here. And she was bending over in the backyard to pick something off the ground. The boxer ran into her, hit her in the knee, sheared the top part of her knee off. Okay, It's called the tibial plateau. She sheared it off. Well, and she had her operation down here. Um, and so the doctor used sequel, packed the knee, all right, that had been broken, packed it with sequel. And so you guys have seen sequel, it looks like a sponge, right? Well, her body essentially remodeled her bone around the sequel. It tore the sequel down as it remodeled the bony matrix and it pretty much kind of rebuilt uh, uh, a portion of, of, her, of her leg, <laughs> of her knee, so to speak. It wasn't a terrible amount of damage, but pretty much just this region right here had been sheared off. And so this doctor just filled it up with sea coral, and then this process that we're talking about here, all right, occurred in my mother. So, so is, you got, is sea coral like a replacement for the, um, the concrete stuff that the body that naturally produces? Well, it was, he used it as, as like, a, a, like a, a model because it's, it's got the trabecular patterns there and whatnot. So it was able to uh, tear down because it's sea coral is essentially sea salt, which is a lot of calcium, there's phosphate, I don't know the other uh, uh, substances that are there. Nothing harmful to the body because uh, it was sterilized. And then it just tore it down and then just kind of remodeled it around that. It was actually, it was really kind of a neat, I don't even know if they still do that process anymore. Who knows? Um, so that's what we're seeing here, okay? We're seeing, all right, a remodeling of that calcified cartilage matrix, and now we're just tearing it down and replacing it with our bone matrix here, okay? So that's what's going on here, and by week 12, most of our long bones, any of the bones that are involved in endochondral ossification, have got this primary ossification center in full effect, okay? All right, so that's step three for... This is the last long one, okay? So 
Now, mind you, everything I'm telling you, this is all, everything that I've told you up to this point is going on. This is occurring simultaneously, all right? So the primary ossification center, all right, is in full swing now. So just after the primary ossification center kind of goes, you know, into full swing, we start to form what we call our secondary ossification center, okay? Where is the primary ossification center? Diaphysis, right, good, you need to know that, all right? The secondary are gonna be in the epiphysis, okay? In the proximal and distal epiphysis. So the same type of situation, you already know, you already know the story. It's the same story, okay? Boy meets girl, oh wait, that's a different story. Uh, and this story here is, all right, we have hyaline cartilage, it calcifies, it hardens, all right? And that calcification process ends up killing itself, so when that happens, that tissue degenerates. Guess what happens after that? Blood vessels, all right, they're like the uh, scavenger. They roll on in there, all right? They move into the area, and they bring their osteoprogenerator cells with them. And so we see what happens now. Those osteoprogenerator cells will give us osteoblasts, which will make the osteoid, which will then uh, calcify and harden. And now we have bone matrix there, okay? So this is what's happening all the way. Bone displaces cartilage, okay? And this is going on before, all right, you are at full term, okay? Not all the bones in your body have ossified, all right? A good number of them have, okay? But not all of them, okay? Wait, what? Now you've intrigued me. You pull out a tube? Like oh, tooth. Oh, I thought you said tooth. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, there's, yes, there's going to be nervous innervation, especially in the root there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Some of it. Like, what's like, you have, like, how it goes through, like, the Yep. Yep. You got blood vessels in there. Yeah. So, now, we talked about bone formation, and you guys probably don't remember, uh, we didn't, well, we did talk about it. But then if you have bone formation, then you also have bone resorption, okay? And that's when we have to reclaim some of the bone matrix. And our osteoclasts are the cells that do that, all right? So keep in mind, uh, your, your bones are constantly remodeling themselves all the time, all right? If I were to go and live a year up on the moon, all right, where there's less gravity there, my body weight would be less. I put less stress on my bones. My bones remodel my, th themselves, all right? to handle that lighter weight. So they actually will become more osteoporotic, sort or osteopenic, all right? If I went to a planet that had four times the gravity, that weight there on my bones would trigger my bones to grow or, or produce more bone matrix to make my bones more dense, all right? So in order for that to happen, if, if we're going to resorb some bone, all right, we need these guys, our osteoclasts, all right? And so they're going to resorb some of that bone matrix all right, because we need to alter some things, move some things around. But in the, di in the diaphysis, we need to make our medullary cavity, okay? Our adult bones have the medullary cavity. That's what we'll find later on the yellow bone marrow is going to be, all right? So and this also helps to make our bones a little bit lighter. So that's what we're seeing here, okay, in step four. All right, we're starting to see, now we've got our secondary ossification centers coming into play, okay? So the primary is still going, doing its thing, okay? And then the secondary, it's starting to do its thing. It's making some bone islands in here. It's resorbing the degenerated calcium or, or, or well, calcified cartilage matrix here and also down in this uh, epiphysis. And while all that's going on, all right, now we're starting to get some resorption of the bone matrix here in the diaphysis. We're starting to hollow out our bone, all right, getting it ready for the adult form of the bone, all right, because we're going to have tons of blood vessels in here, all right, and possibly even some yellow uh, bone marrow. Right now, this is filled with red bone marrow, okay? You can't see in this drawing, but there's red bone marrow in there because, remember, we're still dealing with an infant, all right, a child. And so when you're younger, all right, your long bones are still helping out with making some of the, the hemopo hemopoietic blood cells. 
All right, that's, I promise you, that's the last of the long um, steps. All right, here we go. Step five, easy, okay? This step here, all right, is where we're just going to continue on with what I've been talking about, all right? Bone replaces cartilage throughout the whole bone, except there's two places, and that this should make sense to you. You shouldn't even have to memorize this fact. Well, we're not going to destroy the articular cartilage. We need that, okay? So that cartilage is safe because we need to have the articular cartilage on the ends of our long bones so they can all right, articulate with another bone. So we reduce our friction and have a shock absorber. And then we have our growth plates, our epiphyseal plates. All right, those are still in play also. Okay, but the cartilage everywhere else is gone. Okay, so for the articular cartilage and the epiphyseal plates, those are fine. All right, and this occurs for years and years and years. You hit your growth spurt, you're going through your teens, all right, late part of your teens, maybe in early 20s. All this is going on. All right, so step five goes on for a long time, all right, through all your growth spurts and everything. Well, eventually, everything that starts has to come to an end, all right, and so it's time to shut the party down. We're done, all right? You're as tall as you're going to be, okay? So we're going to get rid of the epiphyseal growth plates. So they eventually ossify. There's no more cartilage there anymore, and so they fuse together, and that yields us the epiphyseal lines, okay? So this happens at the end of puberty when we're all done growing, all right? So again, usually adolescence goes into your early to mid-20s, all right? The numbers you'll hear will vary. I know some people that still grow into their 30s, okay? So not all your growth plates will uh, eventually ossify completely, all right? But anyways, this is what we're going to see in the last stage here. So let me go down to wait, this one. Okay, so this, this one right here, all right, step four here, or step five, excuse me, this is the one that keeps going on during childhood, during your teenage years, all right, as bone, as we keep, remod, or we keep resorbing to make our medullary cavity here, you still got your articular cartilage on the ends of the long bone here, and you still have your epiphyseal growth plate occurring. All right, and that allows the bone to get longer here, okay? But we're still resorbing bone in here, and we're re remodeling all over the place. So that goes on for many years. Eventually, everything ends, and this is what we're seeing here after you're done growing. You can see the medullary cavity, all right, quite predominantly here, tons of blood vessels. All right, we'll have some yellow bone marrow in here too, okay? But you can see our epiphyseal growth plate is closed, all right? They both fuse together, leaving us the epiphyseal line, okay? And the only cartilage that's left is the articular cartilage here, okay? So review it, all right? It's a lot to take in. But I'm telling you, if you, if you know that pattern, all right, of what happens in most cases when a lot of these cells, all right, they're producing their uh, matrix, depending on which type of cell you're talking about, all right, um, most of the time, They'll seal themselves in, and then they'll convert over into a, a site of some type, type. We're talking about bone tissue or cartilage tissue, all right? So, again, if it's still confusing, watch this video. Pause it after each step, all right? Read through the steps. Think it through, all right? Okay, let's talk about some bone growth here, all right? How do you get taller, okay? Remember, appositional, the bone gets wider, but interstitial, all right, the bone becomes longer, okay? So in this case, all right, our long bones are going to get longer because of the epiphyseal growth plate, this cartilage growing, all right, this interstitial growth that occurs. Now, there's five zones here in the epiphyseal plate. I'm going to run through them real quick for you, and then I'll show them to you here because I'm telling you right now, this is in your book, 712A, okay? You need to know... All right, this picture, there's a good chance that you might be asked to identify what happens in one of these zones here, okay? So that's why I'm going to go through it with you. 
So again, I'm sorry if it's annoying, but I'm going to go the first zone. I'll show you the picture so you can see it, and then we'll go back to the other zones here. All right. So the first zone here, all right, the zone of resting cartilage. Pay attention to the name, resting cartilage. Okay. In this situation, not, when it's resting, what do you do when you rest? Pretty much nothing. Maybe watch TV. I don't know. Read a book. Okay. Well, this one here, all right, nothing's going on. All right, this is the mature cartilage all right, that we see. All right. So nothing is happening here. You need to know where this zone is. It's the part that's closest to the epiphysis, all right, furthest from the diaphysis. You will see a mature form of cell in that area, which is the chondrocyte. All right, so this, this zone, nothing is happening right here. Okay, so you can see a bunch of the cells are kind of spaced throughout. All right, so that's the resting cartilage. The second zone is, again, look at the name, proliferating. So there's some activity going on here in this zone. All right, the type of proliferation that goes on here is mitotic division. These cells are not just dividing, but they are rapidly dividing. This is happening at a high pace, okay? And of course, all right, it's going to happen in the parallel to the diaphysis. So we're creating these rows or columns of these chondrocytes, like a, a stacked coins kind of thing, all right, that we'll see, all right? And because they're stacking on top of one another, that's what's going to help us to elongate this zone and elongate the actual epiphyseal growth plate, okay? So keep in mind that this orientation is going to be parallel to the diaphysis. So if I take you over here and show you on this picture here, all right, here you can see the zone of proliferating cartilage, and you can see how all these chondrocytes are just stacked up on one another, and they're flattened, they're smooshed together because they're getting stacked on top of one another, and the lacunae are invading each other's spaces. But it almost looks like a row you know, of stacked coins here, or columns of stacked coins. All right. Zone three. I'm having a blah moment. Can you remind me? Oh, yeah, the diaphysis is the shaft of the long bone. Okay, that would be this part. This is the diaphysis. You got it. And keep in mind, we're, ta we're starting out by here, by the epiphysis, and we're working our way towards the diaphysis in these zones. So the resting zone is this part right here. The proliferating zone is just below it. Okay? Whoops, where are we? Number three. All right. So again, I love, this is one of the times where whoever started labeling this stuff actually made it easy on people or easier on people to learn the material because they didn't give it some funky name. These zones are named for what's happening, what they're doing. All right. You look at the hypertrophic change, or excuse me, hypertrophic cartilage zone here, and it tells you exactly what they're doing. They're going to hypertrophy. As you remember, hypertrophy is just an increase in the size of the cell. Not the number, but the size, all right? A bodybuilder working out is making their muscles swollen, all right, from working out, and that's hypertrophy. That's what we're seeing here, all right? So they're no longer dividing, but now they're getting big, okay? They're getting big. So that's what we see here in this picture. All right, now you can see these cells, they're no longer flat and jammed together, they're growing, they're hypertrophying, becoming larger and larger. All right, you can see the lacunae a little bit better here. All right, they're spacing themselves out. Just two more to go. All right, the zone of calcified cartilage, guess what's happening here, okay? Yep, you're right, all right? <laughs> the cartilage matrix is calcifying, okay? So what we're seeing now, all right, what did we remember? Calcium kills, you can also, I mean, keratin kills, but you, we could also think, you know, calcium kills chondrocytes. That's essentially what it's doing, right? We saw it when we were talking about endochondral ossification, all right? We, so you're getting all right, these chondrocytes now that are 
stuck in this matrix that's calcified, they essentially kill themselves off. And then the final zone here is the zone of ossification. So this basically is telling us right now that now we have that those chondrocytes have died. Again, they've left holes there. Now we're just going to send in our bone remodeling cells, all right, which are going to be our osteoprogenerator cells. And guess what? They bring their capillary buddies with them, all right, to kind of help out to bring in more cells, to bring in more nutrients, to build this stuff. And that's what happens. And this happens closest to the diaphysis, all right? So this end is closest to the diaphysis. This end is closest to the epiphysis. So now we have our, our cartilage. I'll zoom in a little bit. It's becoming ossified, or not ossified, excuse me, calcified. So now you can see in some of these lacunas, there's nothing there. They've died off. All right, so this process here, these chondrocytes, all right, this, all this is starting to calcify here. The chondrocytes die off, all right, and then in our last zone here, all right, we've got our, our capillaries, which are bringing in blood cells, and it's starting to convert all this material that's calcified into our, osteo, our ossified uh, bone matrix. And that's what we're seeing. We're starting to get our bone matrix being secreted here, all right, and we're just laying it down on top of that calcified cartilage. This is all dead. It's dead. Okay, so basically when we're talking about the part uh, that will receive the growth area, right, which part of the, uh, of the uh, epiphyseal growth plate is the region in which we see movement or growth of the bone. It's these two zones here, zone two and three. One, proliferating, they're mitotically dividing rapidly, so we're getting a lot of cell growth, that's hyperplasia, okay? And then the next uh, um, zone, we get the hypertrophic, all right? So those cells that we've now increased the in number, right now we're gonna increase them in size. And a combination of both of those zones here helps to push that resting cartilage up towards the epiphysis. So it pushes the epiphysis away from one another, okay? So where at one point, your bone was like this, okay? Now it's like this, okay? Because of those two zones are pushing the epiphysis away from one another. Is the bone, is the width? We're going to get there. Probably won't get there today. <laughs> um, but we're going to get there. All right. So the epiphyseal plate, keep in mind, all right, we see a lot of activity in through our childhood period of time. But then it, we move into puberty, and at the latter at parts of puberty, all right, so everything starts to slow down, okay? The proliferating cartilage zone, zone two, and then the hypertrophic cartilage zone three, those areas start to slow down. We're not seeing as much mitotic division, and we'll talk about how certain hormones can affect all right, the growth place. We're just not going to talk about that today, okay? Mm. Did I skip? I did. Shame on me. Let's do appositional bone growth, and then uh, I think we'll stop for today because, yeah, that'll bring us into – yeah, 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 yeah. All right. So – we saw interstitial, okay, how the bone gets longer. How does our baby bone become a big, thick adult bone? All right, that's going to be the appositional growth, all right? That's how it's going to get wider, okay? Remember, appositional occurs at the periphery, all right, outside the bone. What's outside of our bone material? The periosteum, okay? Periosteum is outside the bone. That's that covering of the bone. And so that inner cell layer is where we have our osteoprogenerator cells, our osteoblasts, all right? So what we're going to see here, as I zoom in, all right, here you can see the periosteum, that's going to be growing bone on the outside. But don't forget, on the inside, what do we have lining the inside of the bone? It's another covering. Endosteum. Yeah, it's endosteum. All right, so you got periosteum on the outside, all right, but you have the endosteum on the inside, okay? 
So as you can see here, right, as the periosteum is growing bone on the outside, it's making this part here thicker. Okay, but on the inside, that endosteum, it's got osteoclasts in there. And so those osteoclasts, right, along with the help of osteoblasts, because they have to remodel things too, we still have to put some bone matrix down to fix, you know, whatever we were damaging. But those osteoclasts are in overdrive, and you can see here's the original size. Here's our medullary cavity in the kid. Here it is now, but now we're going to make it even bigger. We start to resorb the inside of that bone. Same thing, as the periosteum keeps growing bone on the outside, all right, the endosteum on the inside is also going to be resorbing that bone, making it bigger and bigger until we get to this, okay? So you've got to think that as the outside, the periosteum, the osteoblasts are making that bone, okay, thicker and thicker and thicker on the outside, okay, the osteoclasts on the inside portion here of the medullary cavity, they're going to be resorbing that bone, okay? So the medullary cavity itself is getting bigger and bigger and bigger as the outside of the bone is getting bigger and bigger. So that's how we get our appositional growth, okay? So as where we were, you can think of it in a step-like fashion, like, we're going to lay down 100 layers of bone on the outside here, and then the osteoclast will resorb the old part. Then we'll lay down another 100 layers of bone out here, and then the endosteum will resorb the, the old bone on the inside. However you want to think of it. But, part, like, yeah, oh, yeah. Like a tree, you know, um, and I've seen some trees that are, there was a tornado that came through Botany Wood area there over – Wade Hampton, Save More. You guys remember the Save More? That place is gone. But anyways, there was a tree that fell over, and it reminded me of this bone right here. It had this the center of it was all just gone. It was hollow. It was a sick tree, I have to assume. Uh, again, not a botanist, but um, or wait, that's an arborist, right? Trees are arborists. Um, anyways, but it, it reminds me of this. And at one point, it was much smaller, like a little stick. All right, and then it just kept growing out and growing out, and then as it got thicker and wider and wider, the inside became more hollow, just as it through the remodeling process. So that's how we get appositional bone growth, and that's a perfect place to stop for today. Not bad, not bad. All right, you folks at home, if you have any questions, just say.